Yeah, now let's look at another explanation for why dropout might perform well. And this is in the context of ensemble methods. So we can essentially see dropout as an ensemble method, as I will show you in the next couple of slides. And um, yeah, what is an ensemble method? So students who have taken 451, we talked there about ensemble methods a lot. We talked about, for instance, um, majority voting, begging, random forests, boosting. You don't have to know any of that for this class here. Um, but in a nutshell, what is an ensemble method? It's essentially a combination of multiple models where you average the results of the models. So you can think of it intuitively. Let's say you have to make an important financial decision. Let's say um, yeah, you, you want to make or you want to buy something or invest. Let's say you want to invest into something and it's a very important decision. So you consider asking an expert. So the expert here is your model and it might give you a prediction or some advice. Um, that might be yeah, a good advice if it's an expert and the expert knows the topic very well. However, in practice, it's usually an even better idea to ask a couple of experts and then consider yeah, the shared opinion of the experts. So it's not always um, better than, uh, let's say, the opinion of a single person, especially if yeah, the committee doesn't agree with a single person and the single person knows something the committee doesn't know. But on average, usually asking a committee of multiple people is a better idea than just relying on the opinion of a single person, right? So in that way, using multiple models and then averaging the predictions or taking the majority vote is also often a better idea than yeah using a single model. Why don't we do that always then? Yeah, well, because it's usually very expensive to train models, especially in deep learning. So in deep learning, I would say most of the time we want to um, focus on a single model because it's computationally cheaper. And we also often care about yeah, improving a model in general. And then let's say in production, you can always yeah, train multiple of these models and then combine them to make the predictions even more robust. In any case, uh, talking about the ensemble approach now, why dropout can be seen as an ensemble method. So you can think of um, yeah, dropout the procedure uh, as having a different model for each mini batch, right? So because you randomly drop nodes, each forward pass, each mini batch will see a slightly different model. And essentially what we do is we sample over two to the power of h models, where h is the number of hidden units, if we only consider a hidden layer. If we have multiple hidden layers, well, this becomes uh, even larger. But if you have already, let's say, or if you only have a hidden layer with 10 units, you already have 10 to the power of 10 possible combinations of hidden layers that you may sample during uh, each forward pass. So in that way, it, it can be seen as a model ensemble, um, except that there is one restriction and the restriction is that we have a time dimension. So we don't have these models in parallel, right? So what I mean is if we have, say, a hidden layer, or a unit um, network like that, and another network like that, and let me, I'm running out of space. Let's say each of these is one multilayer perceptron. I'm not connecting all the units here, but let's say in this first one, first forward pass we drop this one and the other one we drop this one and then here we drop these ones so we have three different networks here but we don't use all of them in parallel right we usually because it's a training for for loop we go through them one at a time so we have during the first forward pass maybe this model during the second pass this for uh, this model and during the third pass this model so there's essentially a time constraints or restriction and we can also see this restriction as weight sharing because the second model receive oh, I mean, it will the first model will update the weights and then the second model will be depending on the weight updates from the first model right it's just like how the regular training works because each iteration you update the weights and each consequent model will work with the weights from the previous backward pass. So in this way, there's like this weight sharing between the different forward passes. So there's the weight sharing over these models. And yeah, we can see that as a type of regularization, like a constraint, an additional piece of information or constraint that we add. 
So in that way, we can see this um, weight sharing as a yeah as a regularization, and still we have I mean while we have this weight sharing during training, we could technically create all these different models after training during inference and then average over all these models. I mean, there's nothing that prevents us from doing that. The only problem with that is if we even only consider a small case with 10 to the power of 10 combinations, this is like a very large combination of models. So this is very, very, very expensive. And this is something we technically wouldn't want to do in practice because, yeah, it's, it's just way too expensive. But yeah, let's just for a second continue with this thought experiment and assume we have now yeah, created all these models for or during inference. So for instance, if we had a hidden layer with 10 units, we have these 10 to the uh, 2 to the power of 10 models. Let's call that M. We have M models now. So how do we average the predictions of these models? For simplicity, think of a binary classification case. And in this case, it's essentially averaging the log likelihoods of the predictions, which is um, essentially what you probably know as the geometric mean. So for instance, um, if we have a p a probability score p for a given test data point i, so if this test data point i here, then we multiply all these probabilities for the m models and take this uh, to the uh, one power of one over m. And here I was just rewriting this to show you this is yeah essentially averaging log likelihoods. So um, it's a sum over the log likelihood terms here. And then times one over m, and here I'm just adding the exponents. So I was just taking, um, considering the log of this here, and this one undo the undoes it. So it's essentially the same computation. And here inside you can think of it as averaging the log likelihoods. So essentially, what this is, it's we are computing the geometric mean. So that would be one way we can combine the predictions. And um, yeah, if we have multiple classes, um, more yeah, more than uh, binary classification. We also want to normalize these so that they sum up to um, one the probabilities because we have multiple classes, right? Uh, if we have multiple classes, we have multiple probability scores and ideally we want them to sum up to one. And the class label can then be obtained by considering the class with the highest probability. Yeah, but this still doesn't solve our problem that this is very computationally expensive because we have, we have to consider 2 to the power of 10 models, right, for averaging. And here this is also assuming that we only have one hidden layer with only 10 units. If we have a hidden layer, let's say, with um, 64 units, then yeah, this would be really infeasible. So what do we do about that? How can we um, address this problem? So. Actually, the regular dropout technique that we discussed earlier essentially is already computing this geometric mean, or essentially it's approximating this geometric mean. Because, yeah, the scaling factor that I mentioned, the 1 minus p, that we use to scale the data after training when we use the model for testing, this is essentially an approximation of this geometric mean. So we don't have to create all these different models. We only consider the last model after training, so just the model that comes out out of training and then this scaling will essentially compute an approximated version of that geometric mean as they mention in the original dropout paper and um, they also argue essentially if you um, have a linear model then the geometric mean would be ex uh, actually exactly like this scaled version here so essentially we are approximating the geometric mean in dropout of a model ensemble and this is essentially yeah, the explanation of dropout why it might work well because essentially we can think of it as a model ensemble 